Tenakoto Kator. No mai, hare mai, ke tenazui. Ki tamaki makoro, aho, e noho, ana. Ke WSP, aho, e mahi ana. Ko David, aho. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Kidd. WSP's Director of Client Experience and Str Strategic Advisory in New Zealand. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Helen Clark Foundation and WSP to our webinar on what it takes to create community connection and eliminate loneliness in New Zealand. We have a full house today. Uh, we already have over 350 people online and, and it's still climbing. We have a terrific panel of experts who will be sharing their insights and answering your questions, and I'll introduce them to you shortly. This webinar forms part of the Foundation's post-pandemic future series and marks the launch of the report, our joint research report into solving for loneliness. We published the report last night and it provides six public policy recommendations which we'll cover in our discussion today. It also is the first in our series of joint research which the Foundation and WSP are undertaking to provide an evidence-based approach to stimulating public policy discussion and action on some of the most important societal issues facing New Zealand. The Foundation and WSP formed our partnership uh, out of a shared purpose and desire to create a New Zealand which is better for future generations. For us at WSP, there is no better year to do this than in 2020, as we're marking our 150th year of shaping the critical infrastructure for Aotearoa. So why loneliness? It is very likely that during the recent COVID-19 lockdown, some of you experienced loneliness or social isolation. This is an important distinction, as it's both possible to be socially isolated but not lonely, or conversely, lonely but not socially isolated. And paradoxically, in a world of social media and digital connectivity, increasing number of us report feeling lonely. WSP has been researching loneliness for four, over four years now. What we've discovered is that loneliness is not well understood and common misconceptions exist, such as loneliness affects older people when most of the research shows that, that that actually affects younger adults much more. Loneliness, to put it bluntly, is bad for individuals and bad for society. Studies show, and our report shows, that loneliness is literally life-threatening. People who experience, experience sustained loneliness have much poorer mental well-being, worse economic outcomes, and shortened life expectancy. We believe, therefore, solving for loneliness is an important objective for central and local government and indeed everyone involved in the planning, designing and building of communities. Which brings me nicely to our panel of experts today, who will lead our discussion, which will be followed by an open session in which you can ask questions. We'll also be seeking your personal perspective on some aspects of loneliness during the seminar using the Zoom poll. Stay tuned for details on this later on. So let me introduce our panel. Firstly, it is my privilege to introduce the writer honorable Helen Clark, one of the world's most influential leaders in the field of public service and policy. Helen, of course, served three terms as New Zealand Prime Minister from 1999 to 2008, before becoming the administrator of the United Nations Development Programme. And at the same time was the chair of the United Nations Development Group, Helen was the first woman to hold, assume both of these positions, and she held them for a full two terms and eight years uh, before standing down in April 2017. Helen now applies her considerable leadership, network and mana to advocate on behalf of some of the most important local and global issues facing society today. Welcome, Helen. Our next panelist is Karinia Fuinati. Karinia is one of WSP's rising stars in our property and buildings team. Karinia is an architect with a passion for understanding how to solve loneliness through design. 
Specifically, Corinia has been working on research with the University of Victoria to understand the impact of loneliness on students and how the design of student accommodation can solve for this. On behalf of Jade Karke, one of the contributors to our report, Corinia will also share insights into how the concept of Papakayanga housing can help solve for loneliness. Welcome, Corinia. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Hayley Fitcher. Hayley is the General Manager of Urban Master Planning and Placemaking at Kanga Aura. In this leadership role, Hayley oversees how Kanga Aura designs communities and housing in a way that promotes inclusivity and social connectedness. Hayley is an urban design and planning expert by profession, and she's previously held senior roles at Auckland Council and Gensler, the global architecture and design firm. Hayley is also joined uh, by Paul Commons, the Deputy Chief Executive for People and Communities at Kainga Aura, who will join for part of uh, the Q&A session and will be available to answer questions as well. So welcome, Paul. Our next panelist is David Simons. David is founder and global lead for Future Ready at WSP a global research and design program which uses research insights on global megatrends to help clients see the future more clearly and design for it today. David joins us from London, where he's a senior member of WSP's UK leadership team. In 2018, David was the UK's Business Green Leader of the Year, and in 2020, he was the UK's Society for the Environment's Environmental Professional of the Year. In his role, David is an advisor to central and local government and multinational companies worldwide. And David oversees WSP's research into loneliness and has been instrumental in applying the principles and understanding we get from these insights into the way we design for communities to solve for loneliness. David, a very warm welcome to you and thanks for joining us at this late hour. Our next panelist is Holly Walker. Holly is the deputy director at the Helen Clark Foundation. She's also the WSP Fellow and author of the, our report on loneliness, Alone Together. Holly joined the foundation after five years as principal advisor at the office of the Children's Commissioner. Prior to that, Holly was a Green MP with responsibility for the children, housing, arts and cultures portfolio. Holly is also a Rhodes Scholar and author of a memoir called The Whole Intimate Mess about having her first baby in Parliament. I'm assured that she didn't literally have her first baby in Parliament, but the book was about the challenges of being an MP and having a baby at the same time. Mm. A very warm welcome to you, Holly. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And finally, please welcome Cathy Errington, who will be our panel and discussion moderator today. Cathy is the founding executive director of the Helen Clark Foundation and has been instrumental in establishing it over the last 18 months. Her notable achievements so far include the publication of some important research covering critical topics such as climate change, social media, housing affordability, and personally presenting a report on building on the Christchurch principles at the Paris Peace Forum in 2019. Previously, Cathy worked as a diplomat with the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which included a stint at the New Zealand Embassy in Japan from 2013 to 2018. So please join me in welcoming Cathy. And importantly, please join me in welcoming all of the participants with a virtual homai to Paki Paki uh, to the panel. And so I'll hand over to you now, Cathy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, kia ora koutou and welcome everyone. Uh, my, like David said, my name's Cathy Errington. I'm the Executive Director of the Helen Clark Foundation. We're very excited to be here today launching what for us is our seventh uh, report. If you look at our website, you can see some of that other work David mentioned. But today we're here to launch Alone Together, a report by our Deputy Director Holly Walker into the challenges of loneliness. Uh, that particularly in this moment as New Zealand tries to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and as we dealt with the impact of lockdown which restricted our ability to, to socially interact with each other. I think a lot of us became more aware how much loneliness we'd allowed to creep into our ordinary life. So the lockdown served to worsen what was a pre-existing problem. 
But before I get into the substance and start uh, asking questions of our distinguished panel of experts, I'd like to just cover off a few uh, Zoom housekeeping issues in case for some of you, you haven't joined a Zoom webinar before. If you have, apologies, this will all be very familiar to you. But I wanted to firstly reassure you that uh, we cannot see you and we cannot hear you. Your microphone is off uh, and your camera is off. So if you need to take a call or uh, move papers around, you can do that and you're not going to interrupt us. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that you can't interact with the webinar. Um, the way to do that is through the Q&A function. And I suggest you bring that up uh, on the side of your screen, whether you have questions or not. Uh, if you have your own question, you can type it into the Q&A section and I may ask it of our panelists. And if you see questions you like, you can like them and that will move them up to the top of the list and make it more likely that I ask them. Uh, You'll also see down the bottom of your screen a, a chat function and that one is for a technical problem. So if you can't see me or you can't hear me, um, please uh, put that in the chat function and that'll go to Paul, my colleague who is managing the back end of this webinar today. Uh, so please don't put questions for the panelists in chat, just put those in Q&A. Uh, so if, that, um, if, if that's all clear, I'll move on to the substance. Uh, so the Helen Clark Foundation is a public policy think tank and our goal is to make New Zealand a better place to live. Uh, our values are all about making New Zealand a more inclusive and sustainable society. Uh, and today uh, we're launching the report Alone Together by Holly Walker and um, hopefully Paul can um, share a link to the full report in the chat so that you can digest it in, in your own time. Um, but uh, for now I'd like to turn to Holly uh, and Holly, you've looked into the evidence about how loneliness affects health and well-being for this report. Could you sketch a picture for everyone on the webinar today of loneliness in New Zealand, basically telling us who is lonely and why does it matter? Yes, good morning. Tina Koto Kato, Ngamahi Nui Kia Koto, and um, thank you all very much for um, being part of this. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Yes, so I guess the key finding really of the report is that loneliness is really important. It's an important public health and public policy challenge. Um, and that's because it has a really significant impact on our health and well-being. Um, the very, very short uh, explanation for why that is, is that as human beings, we are, you know, we evolved to live communally and we rely historically and to this day continue to rely on each other for our survival, for food, for shelter, for um, literally our lives. And so when we perceive ourselves to be isolated from other people, um, it triggers in our brains a stress response that is akin to a life-threatening situation. Um, and that's very useful if we actually are in a life-threatening situation and we need to get out of it very quickly. Um, but when it becomes uh, prolonged or is ex experienced very severely and for a long period of time, it's very bad for our health to be in that stress response all the time. So it can mess with our hormones, it can mess with our sleep patterns, it can increase our risk of developing various um, health conditions, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, dementia, obviously mental health, um, mental ill health, uh, all um, all exacerbated by loneliness. Our risks for those things are all exacerbated. So it can have the effect of shortening lifespans. And when we looked into um, the experience in New Zealand in particular, looked both at before the COVID-19 pandemic and then a little bit um, of some indicative research of what has happened since then. So what we learned is that even before COVID-19, um, some people were significantly worse affected by loneliness than others. So while it's normal for everybody to experience some level of loneliness in their lives, um, those who are more likely to be experiencing that dangerous level of loneliness, we can identify from some stats NZ survey, um, survey, there's surveys that have been undertaken. So those include um, people who are unemployed, people who live on very low incomes, uh, young people, as David mentioned in his introduction, sole parents. Uh, there's some evidence that Māori may be more likely to experience loneliness than people from other um, ethnicities. Um, and also, so that's what Stats NZ tells us, 
Other research also tells us that disabled people are also particularly likely to experience feelings of social isolation and loneliness. Um, so it was already a significant challenge and particularly felt unequally by people in, in those groups, but also the pandemic has um, very much exacerbated that existing problem. So obviously during lockdown itself, um, people were under enforced social isolation and um, very difficult to have their normal social um, needs met. And the early indications are that that made everybody more likely to feel lonely, but in particular those who were already at risk. Um, had a significantly worse experience of loneliness during the lockdown. And um, yeah, so those are some of the key findings of the report. Thanks very much for that, Holly. Um, could you quickly run us through the six planks of the policy response you think is needed that you recommend in the report? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I guess the first thing to say is that um, that we're a public policy think tank. So our, our recommendations focus very much on what central government can do with how to set policy that will enable the conditions uh, for social interactions to thrive. Obviously, loneliness is an unmet need for social connection and what that looks like for each individual will be different. Um, but we can we can have we can make policy that makes it easier for people to connect in their communities. So the six things that we recommend in the report are number one that we make sure people have enough money um, because it's very strongly linked, as I said, to low income and unemployment. Um, number two that we close the digital divide. I think the lockdown really highlighted how reliant we are on digital technology. Um, to connect with others, and yet we still have um, more than 200,000 households in New Zealand with no access to the internet. Um, number three, that we support communities to do their magic. So when communities are, um, and community organisations and clubs and, um, you know, all, all manner of community uh, widely defined are supported to identify the goals that they want to solve and work together to solve them. Um, very good social benefits result uh, from that. So that's the third one. Um, the fourth one is that we support people who are already feeling lonely. Um, so when we're designing policies or targeted interventions for people um, to alleviate you know, acute loneliness, um, that we design those for the people that we know are more likely to be affected. Um, creating friendly streets and neighbourhoods, which we're going to focus on uh, significantly during today's webinar, um, because what we know is that when people have the opportunity to interact with each other, um, they will take it because, as I said before, we, we're social beings, we're wired that way. Um, but very often our built environment, our streets, our neighbourhoods, our housing um, can be have been designed in ways that don't encourage us to know our neighbours to interact socially. So. Um, embedding social goals into into our design process can um, really help with that. Um, and finally, investing in frontline mental health, because um, while a lot of these things I've talked about are kind of uh, broad policy settings we can change, we are expecting a really acute um, demand for mental health services, particularly um, now that we, at least in New Zealand, are over the immediate crisis of COVID-19, um, it's sometimes not until after we're out of crisis that people begin to feel uh, the, the mental health effects of a, of a traumatic event like that. So our mental health services, which were already overstretched, will be really important in managing the negative impacts of loneliness. Thanks very much for that. Um, before I move on to the next question, I'd just like to say um, the Helen Clark Foundation is on social media. We're on Twitter at Helen Clark Found, and we're also on Facebook and LinkedIn. So uh, if you are um, here on today's webinar and you're on social media as well, please post uh, about it. We're very happy for you to do that. Um, my next question is for Helen Clark. Um, I was hoping if you could sort of zoom out for us and take a bit of a global perspective during on your time as the administrator of the United Nations Development Programme. Uh, you've always advocated strongly that countries should consider subjective well-being, including measures like mental health, uh, alongside GDP and those harder economic measures. Um, why do you believe that governments need to take that kind of broad approach? Well, first, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thank you, uh, WSP, for being an incredible partner on this work. And thank you, Holly, for a, a really fantastic report. And, and I think one of the uh, biggest insights for me from it was that incredibly strong link between low income 
and unemployment and, and loneliness. And it, it conjures up for us the, the sense of disempowerment one, one feels and the isolation one feels when work by which we tend to identify uh, ourselves goes. I remember back to a, a, an economic a crisis uh, very early in, in my political uh, career in the early 80s and going to a public meeting and saying and someone introduced themselves to speak at it and when he was asked what do you do he said I'm in the army and then he added the army of the unemployed and you just huh. felt what a, a terrible blow uh, this is so in a COVID lockdown all, all that gets exacerbated if you're on your own uh, the job's gone, the income's low, you're trying to cope. You know, we can see the, the, the problems begin uh, to magnify. Now, uh, at UNDP, there were a couple of uh, threads of work on this. Uh, firstly, it adopted what was called the human development paradigm uh, back in 1990 when the first report was launched. And that was always around uh, supporting the full development of the of a, of a human being, the, the, the self-determination, uh, the capabilities and access to health and, and education and other fundamentals were incredibly important in, in that. Uh, there was also the work that was being uh, uh, taken a, a great interest in uh, happening in Bhutan with gross national happiness. And I recall a, a major event at the UN sponsored by the government of Japan with Professor Jeffrey Sachs and others, including myself on a panel. And one of the most profound things that was said to us that day was by a, a, a French uh, a citizen who had become a, a Buddhist a monk in the Himalayas. And he said to us, if a nation is the richest and most powerful in the world, but its people are unhappy, what is the point? And you ask yourself, what is the point? Uh, the truth is that uh, even in societies with relatively high uh, average GDP per capita, there are huge inequalities. We leave people behind. And the fundamental point of the current global agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, is leave no one behind. So I think Holly's report is really a, a huge uh, wake up call that uh, we do leave people behind in, in this society. The uh, crisis of, uh, of COVID-19 and the lockdowns, they exacerbate uh, existing uh, issues. And uh, we need now, as we take stock and move to a, a post-pandemic future, which we all hope will be better than before if we get it right, as in building a more inclusive, uh, fair, resilient, sustainable society, that we can tackle some of these issues. And I think Holly's uh, core six recommendations would put us on a very good course for that. Thank you very much for that. Um, my next question is for David Simons um, from WSP. And so you have been working with WSP on loneliness in the United Kingdom um, for some years now. I was wondering, could you share some of the key insights uh, of how being purposeful about the design of neighbourhoods has facilitated social connection? Yeah, um, absolutely. And uh, yeah, good, good evening, everybody. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to add my, my congrats to, to Holly, because we've been doing a, a lot of work on loneliness um, as one of the key future trends uh, in, in, in WSP. And um, you know what, this is just such a fast emerging landscape. So, so this is a tremendous report. I'm, I'm sure it will be useful in, in New Zealand. It will definitely be useful for my colleagues in the US, in, in, in Europe, um, in South America, um, and, and across the Middle East as well. So what a tremendous resource. Um, the work that we've been doing on loneliness, um, I think we started this because we, we, we recognized in looking with Future Ready at seeing the future more clearly, um, was that loneliness was, was potentially a, a, a real growing issue. And yet it was very much seen as the preserve of governments, of charities, um, of, um, of, of, of NGOs to sort it out. Um, and, and our feeling was really that, that, that actually um, engineering um, and, and the built environment actually had a huge role to play um, in, in overcoming it. Not every role, but, 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 um, but, but an underplayed role. Um, and, and, and our research has shown, and which really Holly's research absolutely backs up as well, is that 
there is a huge amount that we can do in our built environment to design for community. And so, you know, that's things like um, creating shared places that are, that, are, that are owned, so to speak, by small numbers of people, not um, uh, open spaces that, 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 that are there for, for hundreds and hundreds of people and may be owned by a management company. W w you'll see that for, for, both, um, for, for, for both common areas that maybe are owned by um, three or four families and looked after, maybe open spaces um, outside your, 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 your flats as well. Have them owned by, by and looked after by small groups, not just necessarily open for everyone. And that facilitates the opportunity for regular opportunities for brief, easy contacts with up to round about, uh, the research shows, about 24 people. And if you've got that, then you can foster names, friendships, um, and, and the like. And that really then goes to, to, to address just I think some of the findings that, that we found from asking these two questions, and I'd like just to, to ask you two questions now that will just come up on the poll um, now. Um, how many names of, of neighbours do you know? Um, and, um, and, and also, um, have you borrowed anything from a neighbour within the past 12 months? So hopefully there's a poll that has come up on the screen and you can just answer that. Uh, and while you're answering that, let me just tell you just one, one, one brief, um, brief story. Um, it's a chap called Rob McDowell, um, who, who in Vancouver um, was, a, was very successful, lived on his own. Um, and, and could afford a hip flat um, with stunning views um, in, in, a, in, in a tower called 501. It was incredible. He had the penthouse fleet flat. Um, and, and, and it had the most amazing view across the ocean. Um, and, um, and, and, and he began to resent it. And he began to resent it because he was stuck alone with his beautiful view. Um, he was alone with the view. When he left the flat, he had 20 nameless doors. You walked to the elevator, you never knew who would be in it. Um, and, and if you did know who was going to be in it, it could be one of 300 people. And he resented that. As part of the affordable housing requirement, the, 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 the development agent also had to build some townhouses quite cramped, but they all faced a garden and a volleyball court. The people in the townhouses played the volleyball court. None of the tower dwellers did, though they could do. Um, it was seen that it was the tower dwellers um, sort of plot. So, so Rob actually did something quite interesting. He sold his flat on the penthouse and he moved into um, the townhouses. And from there, um, he had not contact with 300 people, but that regular contact with less than 24. He's now got more friends than he wants. He's much happier. He babysits his neighbor's kids. He keeps their spare keys. They holiday together. Um, and it's the courtyard that drives it together. And, and in fact, actually, he even goes as far as saying that um, he, um, he loves six of the people he lives in his townhouse with. And that's just a really nice way of just bringing that to, to life in terms of what just built environment can do. Can we see the results of the poll? Am I asking that to, is that too much to ask for? I don't know, Kathy. Here we go. Okay. So um, let's see how we fare. Um, so so um, this is quite typical. So, so we've asked this question to, 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 um, to, to around about three or 4,000 people across the world now. Um, most people, as you can see here, know the names of between one and three um, people. Um, which is quite typical, but also I find still amazingly surprising if we're trying to build a cohesive community um, and, and the like. Um, the other piece, which maybe goes back to my Rob point, is that 70% of people who live in flats say they don't know the names of anybody else in their apartment block. And so if we're thinking about built environment, that's, that, that's you know, just, you know, just a real opportunity through this report to be doing more. And, and then you can see also the borrowing anything from a neighbor. That's also just a really interesting surrogate for how well connected do you feel in your community? Because if you're connected and you know people, then you will be borrowing something or sharing. Kathy, that's probably enough. Thank you very much for that. That was really thought provoking. Um, I'd like to 
uh, move on to Hayley Fitchett uh, and ask, uh, David just spoke about the idea of designing loneliness out uh, of communities and neighbourhoods. Um, with the creation of Kainga Order, we have the opportunity to try and change the way that we build social housing and urban development projects in New Zealand. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about what plans or projects uh, Kainga Order has in the works to try and maximise social, social well-being. Nā mihi kei te, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, certainly we see, I, I guess, loneliness and, and trying to stand alongside our, part, our treaty partners, mana whenua, and I'd like to acknowledge um, nā mana whenua or tāmaki makaura, um, and also standing along uh, communities as basically written into our legislation. Um, we, our objective is to enhance social well-being, um, environmental well-being, and I see people um, uh, taking millions of tao Māori, people are part of the environment. Um, and so we are very intentional and very conscious when we do approach um, urban development, and certainly we are at the start of our journey as an organisation, um, and our really working with mana whenua at this moment in time to begin to understand where those opportunities are to take um, forward an agenda of promoting well-being and looking at it across the four well-beings um, to really understand how we can connect people at all of the various spatial scales uh, from looking at the home looking at the street um, and certainly um, you know, the, the points that Holly has raised in the research uh, around the importance of the street and the neighbourhood is something that we take very seriously when we look at opportunities to um, work with communities to redevelop uh, our, um, you know, the, the land and the homes that we do own. And people are a key part of that journey. So from our perspective within our urban development projects, we think that empowering people in the co-design and co-implementation space is absolutely critical to starting to build that sense of belonging to a place, that sense of connection to each other um, and to the place in which they live, and also starting to have some quite really interesting discussions around how the built environment, which you know we do have a significant influence over, can start to foster more socially equitable uh, places. So for example in our in our Ross School development we're working with school children and community members to co-create a play street as one of the um, first things we heard uh, when we went out to that community in Ross School South long before we started putting pen to paper and, and you know drawing lines on plans was that people were really worried about the safety of children walking to school um, and if there was one thing that we could do, if we could please just uh, help to influence the street so that it was safe, so that it was friendly, so that there were opportunities uh, for kids to connect to each other, for parents to connect uh, to each other and to others' kids, then that would be the one, th one thing they would like to see us help them achieve. And so now we're crafting through our placemaking team a brief for a play street, Freeland Ave. Um, it's a bit of a mess at the moment. Um, our Civils Alliance put it out here and they're digging it up. Um, but this street will have opportunities for natural play. It will have places where people can gather, um, you know, and keep an eye on the kids, make sure they cross the road safely. It means the street is much more about place. It has a place function rather than just about a movement function. Um, so those are some of the things that we, and we're trying to do that in each neighbourhood that we bring, um, you know, urban development to, uh, is that it is about working with people, empowering people, so that they're designing their neighbourhood, and in the process of doing that, they're engaging with each other and they're breaking down barriers of social, social isolation. Um, and we also look to create, um, you know, break down those barriers between groups of people that may not normally connect in their daily lives. So for example, working, bringing our older customers and tenants together with our youngest, 
uh, and working on projects together um, is a great way of starting to build a shared narrative um, and a shared way of connecting to each other that builds that history that then builds friendships um, and those friendships start to endure because you then feel really connected to your place because you can point to something that you were involved in either designing or building itself and then moving into the, the management um, as well so people then look after it too so we try to work at all of those scales and make sure that we connect people because we like to think that empowering communities uh, is in our DNA because it is in our legislation and we try to be really intentional about that when we enter into a new urban development planning um, process. hope that answers the question. Thank you so much for that. Um, the, the next question is for Karenia Funati um, and it also I see is a theme that's coming through really strongly in the Q&A uh, and one that I will return to uh, when we move to audience questions because one of the report's findings that seems to have jumped out to a lot of people is that the age group that is the loneliest is actually young people um, and that comes as a bit of a surprise to many I think. Uh, young people aged 15 to 24 are the most likely to report feeling lonely. Um, and so Karina, you've been involved with a research project looking specifically at loneliness among tertiary students and how student accommodation can make this worse. Uh, could you talk us through a little bit of your research, please? Yeah, tell off a lover, Kathy. Thanks for um, having me. So, um, yeah, so the research really came off the back of the WSP Future Ready program that we've got running. And I guess in that we were starting to look at these societal trends coming through and loneliness was one of them. And, you know, we, we isolated it, but then we had to look at w how do we connect the dots between what we do, you know, day to day. So as designers, engineers, architects. And so we couldn't ignore we couldn't ignore the stats you know we um so wsp funded co-funded this research for anya seth she's a master's student at victoria university um and the idea was to look at designing out loneliness in student accommodation we could have picked any typology we could have looked at social housing we could have looked at um, aged care facilities but we couldn't ignore the stats um, we, we also knew that universities were starting to look at um, increasing their accommodation, so there, there is a need for it. And so what was really interesting out, coming out of this study, and it was just a summer research paper, so it was, um, it's still going as, as we speak, but we had to look at what is, uh, architects know, it's, it's well known within the architecture community that our design can enhance wellbeing, but are we actually doing that? Are we actually practicing that? Or are we just following building, um, you know, building standards? What is the policy for it? So we needed to kind of front foot it and understand the research, the psychology research and apply that to design. So we're talking about the, the key findings that Anya came up with was, um, what is it about biophilia? So what is it about nat having natural or connections to natural views or whether it's um, plants? How do we do that? Is it color? what colors kind of emit certain emotions. We're talking about student accommodation here. So uh, just for an example, in Wellington, it's quite common for, um, for universities to say, uh, take over a, an, an old um, office building and then convert that into student accommodation. So what actually happens when you've got a structural system that's already set up, that was created for offices, and you're essentially putting rooms in them? There's no kind of pre-research um, or there's no pre-kind of design gone into actually we need to have common spaces every so often. We need to allow the students to go up this lift as they go to their room is it just a corridor that's completely dull or is there some kind of um, way to to activate their their views or activate their emotions by passing you know the common space is there an opportunity for them to take a turn and to, to to have a conversation so those are the kinds of things that Anya came up with and I guess it's not it's not new stuff. There's there's research out there about this already, but the key thing for us is that we we are going to implement this into our designs and actually see how how we can enhance um, well-being through design. 
Thank you um, for those insights. So um, moving on to a new focus area of the report, um, one of the striking findings is how strongly loneliness is correlated with low income and unemployment. Um, and <coughs> hence the recommendation that the government should consider implementing a guaranteed minimum income to enable all New Zealanders to live with dignity. Uh, COVID-19, after all, is an economic and a social crisis as much as a health crisis. Uh, so to elaborate on that, I'd like to hand over back to the Right Honourable Helen Clark, um, because you're familiar with various models of income support from your time both as New Zealand Prime Minister and at the United Nations Development Programme. So what do you think are the key considerations that governments should keep in mind as they're designing social welfare responses to COVID-19? Well, I think that when people you know, think of a guaranteed uh, minimum income, uh, it's important not to confuse that with the idea of uh, a universal basic income. Because to me, the way that the latter has been uh, promoted uh, implies that we would uh, pay to everyone a sum of money uh, which equated to uh, what was required to live on in dignity. The problem is if you pay it to absolutely everybody, you can start to put the zeros on the, the sums of money. Uh, and then you need to move to rather high marginal tax rates to, to claw that back. And then you start to get into all the tax system issues that the, the higher the marginal tax rate, the more people uh, try to find ways around that, setting themselves up as companies rather than paying tax and, and, and so on. So I, I think that uh, it, it politically is always very risky. And at the, the moment with not only the government here, but uh, governments uh, around the world having had to dig so deep uh, to deal with the uh, economic and social impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. I, I just wouldn't want to go there. But I think we do need to look at uh, ways in which we could uh, actually lift low income uh, across the board and ways in which we can guarantee a decent income across the course of the year uh, to the many people in our society who are seasonal workers. Uh, you know, if, for example, you work in the, in the meatworks, so for most, you know, that's not going to be an all year round job. And it takes a, a lot of uh, effort and budgeting to make uh, the money you earn in the, the good months uh, stretch, stretch across. Uh, so I think uh, there needs to be more creative social policy thinking around what, what is uh, a decent minimum income uh, that doesn't average out uh, to you know, the, a, a low level of benefit uh, across uh, the year. I've also been interested in uh, the response and debate around uh, what looks like a, a two-tier uh, benefit response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic where people who've uh, fallen out of work in this period uh, appear to have some temporary access to a uh, a higher level of, of, of income support. And if, if that would be to be perpetuated, that would uh, create uh, you know, long-term issues of, of fairness as, as well. Uh, but you know, bottom line, uh, people have to have enough to live on with dignity. Uh, where superannuation was set was always uh, done with that in mind, but we know that many live uh, well below that level because they're on long-term uh, uh, illness uh, benefits, uh, uh, they, they have uh, longer-term unemployment and, and, and so on. And if, uh, as Holly's research and other research uh, is pointing to, uh, that low income is a significant factor uh, in, in loneliness and that in turn creates ill health, uh, depression, uh, severe consequences, then we can't keep you know, running away from addressing the adequacy of the income issue. 
Thank you very much uh, for, for your insights. Um, my next question is for David Simons of WSP. Um, do you think that the COVID-19 crisis has had additional implications for how we think about combating loneliness, such as people's predisposition to use public transport or to work from home, for example? Uh, and what can we do to improve things? Yeah, great question. Uh, I mean, I think there's, we've spent some time um, already talking about the, the the, the, the real challenge if, um, if, 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 if your economic situation really worsens as part of, of, of COVID and, and, and the global economic downturn that happens. Um, but, but let me also talk about just two, two areas that, 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 are, that are in our minds um, at the moment, um, which are actually more opportunities. Um, so first of all, if you're in, let's say, in, 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 in the US, um, many people, um, if you take, go, go to California, um, historically would have been um, having a, a two hour each way commute from suburbia um, over the mountains to, 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 to their place of, of, of work. Um, and, and as a result, you, you have no sense of community in, in, in suburbia. Um, um, just people living and, and li spending most of their life in, in, in an office or, 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 or away um, and then coming back in the evenings. I, th I would suggest in that circumstance, COVID provides um, a, a forced opportunity to help create community. Um, quite simply because many, many of us um, are, are working from home more. Um, personally, that's letting me spend more time with, with, with my family um, rather than commuting. Um, it's giving us an opportunity to get to know your neighbours, to walk into your to 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 to, to your town, to, to get a coffee, um, to socialise more, to, um, to 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 get to know people. So I think there's one opportunity there. Um, I was also incredibly struck by Haley's point to, to see streets as places and not a movement function. Um, and, and again, across the world, that's also a, a real um, opportunity because as we come out of COVID. Um, people naturally are less predisposed to get on public transport. And so um, we, we, you, we've naturally got two options. Either everybody gets in their car, in which case you have gridlocked streets. Um, or, or secondly, we have a real focus on encouraging walking and cycling and active travel. Um, and you know what, that can be great for, for, for people's health, but also that's a really important part of, of combating loneliness and, and building community. Um, there was a really important study in 1972 by a chap called Donald Appleyard um, that, that drew a direct connection between the traffic flow in your street and the numbers of names of, of neighbours that you know. Um, there was another study um, that, that said from, from 2007 that 68% that I think it was of cyclists who cycle to work um, expressed joy on their way to work. Maybe that's not a, 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 an Auckland autumn maybe, um, but, but compare that to 51% who said they have joy in the car and only 22% on public transport. Purposeful plans for transport authorities to think about how is this an opportunity um, can also bring some real opportunities opportunities and real benefits, but you've got to have a plan and you've got to get on with it. Thank you uh, for that. So I'd now like to move on to some of the audience Q&A to make sure that we ask some of the excellent questions that are coming through. Um, we, the first one I'd like to direct in the first instance to Hayley Fitchett and then ask for some comment from Karenia Funati. Um, and this is a question several people have asked in, in different ways. And so the COVID-19 crisis has really highlighted how reliant we can be on digital technology and social media for connection. Um, and so uh, you, this question is asked by James Shaw and um, Philip Stevenson. So, what, basically, could you give us some comment on on that? Like the a Motu report, for example, recently identified that social housing tenants are the least likely to have internet access in New Zealand. So, uh, Haley, I'd be interested to think to hear if you think there are things that can be done to improve that. Uh, and Karina, I'd be interested to hear your insights on how um, social media can support students and young people connect with each other. So uh, firstly, um, Hayley, could you comment on, on internet access? And I will um, comment in part, and then I will probably uh, defer to my colleague, my esteemed colleague, Paul Collins, because he could 
perhaps take you through um, our COVID response in that space because you know, we do have quite a deep understanding of our customers through you know them just chatting to their tenancy officers um, and we're quite frequently the face of government for many of our, our tenants so I'll let him talk to our COVID response with regards to digital connectivity because also um, that affected not just the the connection of tenants to the outside world during the lockdown, but actually our tenants' ability, our customers' ability to actually learn um, as well. So, you know, we have many, many children of all ages that needed to engage with education. And so I'll, I'll let Paul speak to that. But if I can briefly speak to, I guess, um, the hardware situation. So in um, many of our developments of, you know, of of reasonable sizes, uh, we we provide um, community rooms which are internet enabled, um, recognizing that not only do many of our customers not have the hardware, but also their ability to actually provide for internet plans and pay for them is also quite severely limited as well. And those are um, multifunctional community spaces that. Um, you know, spill out into gardens, they've got kitchens, they have all manner of things. And we do also work with tenants on the design of those and how those are looked after and how they're being programmed and things like that. So that's one of the ways we address that question. But if I could hand over to Paul, because he, he was in charge of a very significant program that actually specifically addressed those, um, those needs during lockdown. And um, I'll let you share his thinking. Thank you. Um. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Paul. I'm, um, I'm very much the landlord um, side of Kaying Aurora. So uh, my job is to look after the uh, people in their homes, make the very best use of them um, and to support them. And as, as you can imagine, the demand for social housing right across the world now is at, at all time record highs. So uh, congratulations, Holly. It's a fantastic report. Um, kudos to the foundations and WSP and our other speakers. It resonates very strongly with our experience. Uh, I'll just give a little bit of a long answer. Public housing, uh, Kaying Aura, we look after um, um, 65,000 homes for the benefit of 200,000 Kiwis. To give you some indication, we house a family every 15 minutes of every hour of every day of, of the year. Um, so we, we, we house five or 6,000 families a year under those homes. Half, half the population in the homes are children, by the way. Um, and so when we traditionally talk about digital technology, we normally come from an educational point of view, first and foremost. Um, the, the challenges with the technology is not so much the availability, but the cost of, of, the cost of ownership and running it. That really is the, is the point. Um, I think we'd all celebrate um, um, our connectivity under COVID. It's been a real godsend for all of us. Um, and it's been very important. Just before I get into... Um, uh, the use of the technology around social isolation and loneliness. I'll just point something out to the audience, which is interesting. So, um, yeah, fam average family composition is about three people per home in New Zealand, but the people we're housing today, the people we're housing um, right now, 40% of our incoming tenants are on their own. So 40% of our incoming tenants are single adults. Um, and the next 40% um, classification is, is small family units, so two people households. So the people where people we have home are quite different to the people we're housing. And what I'd say to the 40% of people who are joining us every day of the year who are on their own, the common the common feature in, in most of the um, our people's circumstances is the lack of um, uh, close relationships either with whānau or, or friends or family. Um, and there's a really common theme. Um, that has driven their vulnerability, they've driven their um, inability to ride the, the hurdles that life throws at us, whether it be health or lack of opportunity on employment. So what does tie them all together is the lack of connection. And in, um, if you look at your own families, you'll find people in your family who are young, who are disabled, who are maybe elderly or, or out of work, and our families rally around and support them and, and, and allow them to ride through these challenges. What's common to our new tenants in particular is they don't have that, they don't have the support, don't have the connections, they're on their own and that's what drive, drives their vulnerability. Um, coming back to the digital question, um, during this period where we, we, we were staying at home, um, we were trying to support remotely, keep people well, uh, we reverted to phone calls. So we've made tens of thousands of phone calls 
um, reinvented the use of the phone, ironically, and we've seen this in other nations. The, uh, the number of calls have gone up dramatically. Um, and good old fashioned phone calls um, have enabled us to have very close one-on-one -on -one relationships with people. Um, it's very much focused on the individual at the other end of the phone and they've been incredibly welcome um, addition to our support. So I, my advice is um, digital technology is very important and, and it is the way of the future, but just that ability to get on a phone and make a connection is very, very powerful. Um, and what is really heartening um, from the increased contact through that is it's highly mobile, it's very cheap, you can do it anywhere you like, or you can do it at all hours of day and night, depending on the circumstances. Um, you can do it relatively frequently as well is that it was very, very well um, surprising. The number of people we called in pretty difficult circumstances, us reaching out to ensure they were, um, uh, they were okay, they had their medicine, they were connecting, they were getting food. Um, in many cases, our, our, our customers, our tenants, were just as concerned about our people who were making the calls as we were about them. So um, that was a really unexpected bonus from COVID. The use of telephones, obviously the use of digital technology in a way has brought us much closer together and what we're really working on now is how to catch that learning and apply it um, as we come out of COVID. Um, so that's our insights on the ground um, and it's great to be part of the panel. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now over to Karina um, to just expand on uh, social media and the way that can help young people connect with each other. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Um, just quickly, I do want to say um, in the research that I talked about earlier, that was um, through the School of Architecture at Victoria and supervised by Dr. Jan Smitheran. Um, but just on this question, I think it's it's really interesting because, um, you know, we know we're, we've been introduced to these stats now about that age group, the young uh, age group that is experiencing the most loneliness and probably the most uh, of the cohort that's also on social media a lot. And so I guess you start to make, you know, you start to ask those questions about, um, are they getting meaningful connection? You know, this connection that we're talking about, is it actually meaningful when you're on the screen, when you're kind of talking to a device? And so um, that's kind of the issue that, you know, I've started looking into it as well is that, um, is it a false sense of connection? Are we kind of seeing um, a curated life, you know, through Instagram, Facebook, and and maybe it's the likes of um, being a bit more engaged through social media. So we, we see our politicians, for example, are, are latching onto this idea of a live, a live feed. You know, our prime minister's um, very well versed in that. So are there, are, is it those types of engagements through social media that we need to be, kind of looking into it as opposed to just I'll I'll like this and I'll like this um, and you know it's it's all very curated so I think that the I guess I'm not really answering the question but answering with another question what is meaningful connection through social media and I don't know <laughs> yeah that's a that's a really uh, interesting area to look look into and I, I think this report has highlighted a lot of spaces that would benefit from further research and that is one of them. Um, my next question uh, during on the audience q and um, I firstly have to apologise in advance, we're not going to get through all of them. They're all very good questions though. Uh, mm -hmm. So this question I'd like to direct to uh, Helen Clark in the first instance and it comes from Julie Ferry who is a member of a local board here in Auckland uh, and is asking what can local government do uh, to support and encourage uh, environments that help address loneliness. Um, and so first, uh, I'd be interested in Helen's insights and then um, uh, hear a bit from Holly. Well, I think local government is actually extremely important and for a number of the reasons that other panelists have already uh, mentioned. How are we designing our cities? Uh, where there's Greenfield's uh, uh, subdivision, uh, what thought is, is given to uh, the people who are going to occupy these physical structures which uh, go on the, on the plots of, of land. I think your uh, local government also has an incredibly important role in uh, supporting uh, community facilities. W when I was a, a young MP in Mount Albert, I very quickly became uh, familiar with the community houses that were provided uh, by uh, the local authority, the Sandringham Community House. There, there was one in uh, 
New Bond Street in, in Kingsland. There was uh, the homestead in Point Chevalier. And these were uh, often old houses which council had purchased or a, a little, little building. And they, they had a community um, uh, uh, supervisor for the facility and the groups could come in and you know, do their different things. People could meet there, have a, have a chat. It, it was really fantastic and it did build a, a sense of community. There was a life around those, those, those houses. So I think anything our councils can, can do to, to focus on well-being and connection uh, within local communities is extremely important. Uh, there was also in, in my part of, of Auckland a, a strong tradition of, of pensioner housing. And that also gave a, you know, a, good, a good sense of, of connection. Of, of course, uh, you know, local government uh, commitment to providing uh, housing waned uh, uh, in, in more recent years. But uh, the pensioner village had a, a great sense of community about it in, in so many places that I knew uh, in, our, in the suburbs of Auckland. Uh, so now, Holly, I, I was interested uh, if you could make some comment on that, because as you know, and as your uh, report uh, mentions, our government uh, has made a commitment to maximising well-being in New Zealand. And I was interested, how do you see the recommendations in your report working alongside that broader commitment to well-being, and particularly that focus on what, what can local government do that mm -hmm. uh, Julie has asked? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just on that broader point of well-being, um, one thing that um, David Simons will be very familiar with and which came up a lot as I was looking into this was the fact that the UK has um, was the first country to, hit, to appoint a minister for loneliness in 2018 and it has a national loneliness strategy. So I looked a little bit into... Um, whether that's something we should recommend for New Zealand. But in the end, I because because our current government has indicated that well-being, um, holistically defined, is the key, you know, decision making driver for government decision making. Um, actually, it's really good that we have that holistic, positively framed well-being. Um, uh, because it's about more than the lack of something. You know, if someone's experiencing well-being, it's about their rights being maximised. It's about them having the opportunity to thrive in many different ways. But within that well-being focus, because of the fact that um, loneliness intersects with well-being in so many complicated ways, loneliness can be something really useful to target as, as I guess, for a proxy for how well we are doing at actually meeting that need for connection and belonging and, and general well-being. Um, and of course, in terms of local government, you know, um, there's been debate and it's gone back and forth over the years in terms of what local government is empowered to take into account as Helen was talking about at different times housing's been more of a focus of local government and social services and and it sort of grows and shrinks depending on the um, direction that comes from central government but you know we do have the four well-beings um, so the, the idea that local government would be empowered to look at environmental, economic, um, cultural and social well-being and, and see its role as being much more than just about the provision of uh, you know, rubbish and rates, as, as people sometimes advocate. Um, one specific thing we, that I did mention in the report um, in terms of local government is that, um, interestingly enough, you know, very often local government is responsible for public transport. Um, and an interesting finding was that um, you know, when people get on public transport, most of the time uh, they're packed in like sardines, they feel very uncomfortable, they don't want to be looking around or touching or interacting with the people around them. And in the light of the pandemic, it's become even more relevant because it's such a, um, perceived as such a risk for infection. Um, but actually when public transport, the interiors of buses and trains are designed in such a way that uh, there's space, um, so seats are further apart, there may be tables separating people, but people are seated facing each other or have the opportunity to um, sit in, uh, in ways where they um, aren't forced up against other people but are able to interact more freely with each other. Um, people are much more likely to engage and then report feeling like quite a significant boost to their mood as a result of speaking to someone else on public transport. So in terms of something local government can do, it's very specific, but I do think thinking about the design of public transport particularly in light of COVID-19 now and the way we're going to use it in future, as David was talking about before, um, will be quite important. Thanks very much, Holly. Um, so uh, Hayley, not can I get a comment on that as well? Um, yeah, of course. I, Over to uh, Holly Fitchett. 
yeah, sorry to, you know, jump in, but I think that I'd like to, you know, big shout out to local governments across the country. They're really having to face up to the significant funding and financing challenges that are now on their doorstep as the result of COVID. And yet, when we're talking about, I guess, the kinds of hardware solutions in the built environment that um, we need and that communities are asking for, many of those things uh, sit with local governments, such as parks and open spaces and plazas, um, it's streets, um, it's looking at uh, environmental quality, so ways of improving biodiversity, um, using uh, low impact stormwater design, um, you know, uh, resurfacing streams to bring back indigenous vegetation and uh, fauna. And all of these things cost quite a lot of money. Um, you know, community rooms cost money, community houses cost money. And so I think that we're really going to have to get quite a lot more creative. And there are some incredible ideas that are coming out of various departments and local authorities that are responsible for capex spending, uh, that are responsible for infrastructure, and there's also in the operations space, you know, you can pay for a new library, a people's palace, but actually the more extensive cost is in the operating of the facility. So the, thing, the kinds of conversations we're having um, about creating these spaces and environments uh, are really moving into quite creative ends around, could we provide this in a mobile way? Could we look for joint ventures with iwi? Can we share services with um, the third sector um, and other and community organisations in order to try and leverage off all of our different bits of funding and finance to actually come up with something where the outcome is greater than the sum of individual parts? So I think that built environment professionals, local authorities and Kainga Order, Iwi, um, Matawaka organisations, Pacific organisations, churches, we're going to really have to get really creative in how we build and maintain and operate these kinds of spaces that we all know and that the research that Holly has done tells us are necessary in order to build whanaungatanga, so building those relationships through shared experiences because we were in the same place doing a thing together. So I, I think that it's quite an exciting time and I think that COVID, whilst a very traumatic experience for many people, and a very tragic experience for many people, actually is going to force us to get a lot more creative about how we solve some of these big, tricky societal issues like loneliness. So we've only got time for one last question. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for all your questions and I'm very sorry if yours hasn't been asked. Um, but for the final one, I, I'd like to ask the question from Cheryl Marsh and given it's had the most votes uh, of a question that I haven't asked yet. And so Holly, I'd like to direct it to you just to finish off. Could you comment a bit about investing in the infrastructure for volunteering, um, uh, investing in those that lead and manage the volunteering within our community, NGO organisations? Because I know uh, that your report recommends helping communities do their magic. And can you just explain a bit to everyone listening what you meant and how that could work yes absolutely thank you it's a great question um, I think you know in terms of the actual interactions that take place on a daily basis that can alleviate loneliness that people feel um, it's it's communities that provide those and so that can be community really broadly defined but that can include sports clubs um, you know, social clubs, it can include schools, uh, churches, marae, cultural groups, um, many, many different forms of community organisation, which actually are providing the activities where people can come to feel connected. Um, and very often government, uh, government is a supporter of those community groups through funding um, and sometimes through uh, contracts for service provision. I think what often tends to happen when government is contracting um, for community uh, service provision or providing funding for these organisations is they have a, a goal in mind and they 
um, set quite specific criteria about what needs to be achieved. Um, and so groups can spend a lot of time trying to meet those criteria and trying to report against those. Um, what the literature on community-led development would suggest is that actually when communities are empowered to uh, identify their own goals, um, whether that's, you know, the working towards the creation of a new community facility or whether it's trying to solve a particular social challenge, whether it's um, advocating together as a community for or against a change that they, they don't want to see in their local community. Um, it's when it's when it's a self-selected community goal um, that you see the most success in terms of communities pulling together. So rather than funding necessarily specifically for loneliness related initiatives, um, something that the government can do in the post pandemic um, context is really boost funding for community led development where communities can identify their own challenges. Um, and then pull together to solve those. And as a almost a byproduct, but a very happy byproduct, uh, you tend to see a lot more social cohesion and connection, um, and people reporting a sense of belonging in those communities when they've been involved in projects like that. And a really good example of that in action already is Fana Water, where um, the the funding comes from government but it's delivered at arm's length from government and it's Māori communities, um, whānau, hapū and iwi who identify their own uh, goals and work together to find the right way to solve those challenges. Um, I think in terms of volunteering, um, it's this type of community-led development model that is likely to have the most success and to uh, motivate people and make people feel inspired and uh, like they would like to um, volunteer and be part of those community initiatives. So unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. Um, I would like to thank on behalf of the Helen Clark Foundation, our partner WSP, who helped make this piece of research possible. Um, I'd also like to just mention that the Helen Clark Foundation uh, welcomes members. Uh, if you become a member, you get first notice of our new reports and you get um, to access to special members only events. So if you aren't a member already, please consider joining. Uh, my colleague Paul will stick a link in the chat uh, for how you can do that. Um, so please follow us on social media uh, and have a read of Holly's report, which will go into some of the issues covered today in more depth. Um, just to finish off, I'd like to thank all our panelists, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, Hayley Fitchett, David Simons, who dialed in in the middle of the night from the UK. Thank you so much. And uh, Karina Funati and Holly Walker and Paul Commons, who is the, the silent um, uh, panelist who popped in for the Q&A there. He's also from Kainga Order. Uh, so thank you all so much. Uh, and I hope that we see you again on one of our future uh, events and that we can continue with this kind of research. Uh, so thank you all very much.